Hello and welcome to this webinar on traumatic wound care in dogs. My name is Ian Patterson and I'll be talking to you about how to approach the many different types of wound that we'll see in our clinics and rescue centres today. The title refers to dogs since these will make up the vast majority of companion animals that we treat, but there will be some specific references to cats later on for all you feline fans. The talk will be very much based upon my own experiences of treating wounds in practice with the emphasis on what we can do in situations where we lack all the facilities of a modern veterinary hospital. Dr Liz Welsh works at Vets Now Reveral Hospital in Glasgow. She's very kindly provided the majority of the clinical photographs you'll see in this talk. She is one of the foremost soft tissue veterinary surgeons in Scotland. She's an excellent teacher and someone who has inspired and encouraged me since we graduated together from Glasgow in 1989. As I said, I graduated from Glasgow in 1989. I then spent six years working in mixed practice and travelling the world, looking for vet and other adventures. Came back to Scotland and I settled in Fife, which is on the East Coast, in 1996, where shortly afterwards I studied for and gained the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Certificate in Small Animal Surgery. I spent the next 24 years running a large companion animal vet practice with my partners before deciding at the end of 2020 to come away from primary care practice and devote my time to working with vet charities who have the shared goals of improving animal welfare worldwide and also sharing veterinary knowledge without barriers. Now, one of the most common problems you'll encounter as a vet or vet nurse is the case of an animal presenting to you with a wound. This might be something very simple from a small graze or a fresh cut to a large open chronic wound which is infected and possibly even infested by maggots. The approach to each of these scenarios and everything in between will vary dramatically on a number of different factors which we'll cover in this talk. But essential to all is our ability to understand the basis of wound healing itself. We need to work with the body's own very complex systems of wound healing and understand them in order to try and give these wounds the best chance of healing successfully. Now on the left here is a border collie with a rather large cut in its nose. It looks dramatic, but it's only an hour old and it will do very well with being cleaned and stitched closed, probably without any further complications. On the right, however, is a deep chronic wound with exposure of tendon and bone. And we can tell from the presence of the, the dark red granulation tissue, this tissue here and all the way around here, we can tell that this is at least five days old and quite probably older. This will require a much more involved approach, not only to treat any infection, but also to get to the wound to a healthy enough state to then decide on how it can possibly be closed surgically, if it can. The case on the right was actually a working collie dog in which prolonged aftercare was going to be an issue and so this limb was amputated. This is a situation that you will come across frequently with street dogs. And although this talk is about traumatic wound care, the best way to get this guy on the right back to being healed without complications and back to a good quality of life is to amputate the leg. That's not defeat. That is the right selection for this dog. A lot of the animals you'll see in your clinics may be street dogs, and it's very possible that once discharged from your care, you won't ever see them again. We've got to take this into consideration when we're planning our approach to their wounds. Since a breakdown of any repair, it may not get the benefit of a second or even third surgery. It's much preferable, if possible in these situations, to hold an animal at the clinic until the wound is satisfactorily healed uh, than to effect a quick repair and discharge it the next day. Or, as we've just discussed in that previous slide, if limb amputation is likely to provide us with the best immediate and long-term results, then progress straight to that option. It will be the best for that individual dog. So on the left here, we have got um, a van load of African street dogs. These guys were all coming in for neutering and you can see how well they all get on with each other. On the right, definitely not street dogs. These two little guys here, they wouldn't know hardship if it jumped up and smacked them in the face. We're only going to talk about the wounds themselves today, 
but please remember that the animal is unlikely to die from the wound itself. You have to perform a full clinical exam to ensure there are no other life-threatening issues before focusing in on the obvious. Don't get overexcited at this wound that presents to you. Take a step back, look at the bigger picture. Examples of other injuries may include spinal trauma, head trauma, abdominal bleeding, pneumothorax, pelvic fractures, the list is endless. In this slide here, we have a cat who has a diaphragmatic hernia. Um, the diaphragm line here is quite indistinct. Apart from the heart, we've got very obvious abdominal organ presence within the thoracic cavity and up at the top here you can see the lungs have been compressed to this small area at the dorsal surface. Uh, this cat had an open wound but quite clearly it has got more major life-threatening issues going on that we need to address first. This chap here, a Dalmatian obviously, presented with a very obvious severe skin wound to his right forelimb but he also was non-weight bearing in this. This was following a road traffic accident. The wound needs treatment, obviously, but what else might be going on that could affect our approach here? And here we are. This is the same dog as in the previous slide. Complete open mid-shaft, radial and ulnar fractures. This limb will need stabilised as well as dressed during initial triage to prevent significant pain and further damage to tissue from the unstable bone ends. Before we start to look at wounds themselves in a little more detail, it's worth mentioning a few factors that will be very likely to affect our chances of success in these cases and we shouldn't overlook. In general, the patients you're going to see may not be well-fed animals that get regular antiparasite treatments and constant access to water. Wound healing will be affected by these systemic factors. Pre-existing disease, poor nutritional status, dehydration and parasite burdens will all affect the body's ability to heal successfully, delaying or maybe even preventing wound healing itself. This means that to maximise our chances of success, we not only need to treat the wound appropriately, but we also have to address these other problems by starting a good plan of nutrition, instituting IV fluid therapy, and providing appropriate antiparasite control. The potential for inhibited or delayed healing will also play a role in our surgical choices. That is the type of suture materials we use, for example. Um, an animal that's in poor general health, we would err on the side of a material that will hold its strength for longer than the wound may take to heal. For example, we would maybe use PDS rather than monochrome. This is just a slide of various nasties to show you what animals will probably present with. Here and down here, tick populations, um, severe ascarid inf um, infestation, fleas, ectoparasites, and this little puppy here, uh, very obviously malnourished, maybe just as a heavy worm burden, there may be other pathology going on. So all of these things we need to take into account. Let's begin with a brief overview of wound healing, and I mean brief. We are surgeons after all, since this is an incredibly complex process and more in-depth descriptions can be found in textbooks. Normal wound healing will follow the basic pattern set out here in this slide, although there are different ways of classifying this same process depending on which text you read. The timings that you can see in brackets there are approximate, and they're based upon the predominant cell type and activity present, but it will vary depending on each individual wound. These aren't three isolated individual stages and there's a lot of overlap as the phases progress. The inflammatory phase or inflammation uh, occurs over the first one to four days. The immediate response is hemostasis with the formation initially of the platelet plug followed by the formation of a fibrin network. The presence of fibrin itself attracts the neutrophils to the site, usually within six hours of injury. And neutrophils are the predominant cells in the first one to two days. So neutrophils are the predominant cells in the inflammatory phase. Their principal role is to help prevent infection. After the very early stages of inflammation, neutrophils are then followed by macrophage, and these become the dominant cell types by about day four. 
Um, they're responsible for lots of different things, but principally the phagocytosis of necrotic material and crucially for inducing fibroblast activity, which is pivotal in initiating tissue repair. So the inflammatory phase, you have neutrophils as the first cell type, followed by macrophage, and these macrophages are crucial for inducing the fibroblasts. Think of the macrophage as the conductors of the orchestra. They oversee and facilitate the transition from inflammatory to proliferative phase. During the inflammatory phase, as you'd expect, the wound will classically show signs of heat, redness, swelling and pain. Proliferation. This phase approximately covers from day 4 to 12 and is characterised by the presence of fibroblasts which produce collagen, elastin and proteoglycans. Now if you remember these fibroblasts are attracted by the macrophage in the late inflammatory phase um, and fibroblasts will appear from about day of 4 or 5 at the earliest. They will convert to myofibroblasts which will result in early wound contraction. Fibroblasts are responsible for the laying down of granulation tissue, and we will talk about that a lot later on, which in turn will allow epithelialization to occur. New capillary buds appear and epithelial cells will start to appear in this proliferative phase as well. As a point of interest, granulation tissue will never be present in a dog's wound until day four or five at the very earliest. And to some extent, this will help in trying to decide how old a dog's wound is when it first presents to you. If there's granulation tissue there, and that wound is at least four to five days old, whatever the owner says to you. There are species differences. Um, granulation tissue takes longer to appear in cats, and feline surgical wounds, for example, spay wounds, are significantly weaker than canine surgical wounds a week after surgery. Remodeling is the third and final phase, and this happens over many months. And principally what's happening in remodelling is our weaker type 3 collagen that's present in granulation tissue is gradually replaced by the stronger type 1 collagen. You then get cross-linking of the collagen 1 fibres and this will provide strength to the tissue repair over time. So that's a very simplistic surgeon's view on normal wound healing. And as a surgeon, I want to keep this simple, but I want to understand it. There's many other factors at play, but as I've said previously, Textbooks will provide a much more in-depth description and understanding. So just a quick recap on those three main phases of wound healing. Inflammation, day one to four, proliferation, day four to 12, and remodeling. And the predominant cell types, remember, in the inflammatory phase are neutrophils, followed by macrophage. In the proliferative phase, it's the fibroblasts. This description of wound healing is, of course, what should happen in the ideal situation. But we are never dealing with the ideal situation, particularly with street dogs. There are numerous factors, both local factors and systemic factors, local meaning local to the wound itself and systemic meaning affecting the rest of the body that will affect the ability of a wound to heal. As I said, particularly in the population of patients that we will be coming across in the field. We'll talk briefly about the local and systemic factors that can affect wound healing now. Um, local factors, oxygenation is crucial. Uh, a good partial pressure of oxygen is needed, especially for good function of the cells that we require for the body to heal, particularly fibroblasts and epithelial cells. Um, and the importance of a good partial pressure of oxygen comes into play later on when we talk about the types of dressings that we'll use for wounds. If we starve wounds of oxygen, it's going to delay healing. Poor oxygenation at tissue level can occur for several reasons, including, for example, systemic reasons, the animal having a poor hematocrit or poor ventilatory status. If you think about that cat with a diaphragmatic hernia, it's going to have poorly oxygenated blood, which will lead to low partial pressure of oxygen at the site of any wound. Decreased delivery of oxygenated blood to the wound through reduced cardiac output. That's another reason why you could have poor oxygenation. Or you may have local tissue damage or even poor surgical handling of the tissues. Um, bad tissue handling can have quite dramatic effects on wound healing. And we'll talk more about this soon. And I'll refer to what we call Halstead's principles, which we all should be aware of.
infection. If you close a wound that's infected, it is very likely to break down. So don't rush into every wound that you see and close it. You will get a nice neat result on the day, but two to three days later, you'll regret that decision. You can re reduce the risks of infection with good skin clipping and aseptic preparation, the use of antibiotics, correction of hypovolemia using IV fluids and ensuring that the patient is not hypothermic and it's not hypoglycemic. These will all help reduce the risk of infection. Aside from oxygenation and infection, another two local factors that we need to consider are physical issues uh, affecting the wound itself, such as the presence of dead space, necrotic material, accumulation of fluid, whether that be seromatous fluid or blood, and the presence of foreign materials such as dirt or vegetable matter, or even previous sutures, if this is an old wound that you're going back into. Mechanical factors as well. Um, can affect wound healing. The excessive movement of the limbs, for example, wounds in the axilla or the groin, uh, if they're not immobilised correctly. Self-trauma from your patient itself. Um, it's crucial that whatever work we do with wound repair, we make sure our patients can't destroy that work themselves. So the use of bandages, collars, t-shirts, etc. Aside from these local factors, we've also got systemic, systemic factors to consider which can affect wound healing, the most obvious of which is age. We know that young animals heal better and old animals take longer to heal. Uh, concurrent disease, such as Cushing's disease, diabetes, cancers, heart disease, renal disease, hypothyroidism, the list is endless. Malnutrition, something that will be very prevalent in the street dog population. Hypoproteinemia, will delay healing, and whether that's due to malnutrition or due to another comorbidity, such as chronic diarrhea, liver or kidney disease, gastrointestinal disease, heavy parasite burdens, we've already spoken about that earlier on. So both the local factors and the systemic factors, these are not intended to be exhaustive lists, but rather just a reminder to us all to look at the bigger picture. Don't zoom right in on the wound itself. So hopefully, that was a relatively simple walk through wound healing. At least all I think we need to know as surgeons working out with a hospital environment. That's the main thing. Next, we're going to move on and talk about the fun bits that really, we really want to do and do successfully, regardless of how little equipment or facilities we have. Before we do though, there's one more slide of text, if you'll bear with me, that we all need to remind ourselves of on a daily basis, if we're surgeons. And that is of the seven of Halstead's principles. I can honestly say there is rarely a single surgery I perform where I'm not consciously thinking about some or all of these principles. And here they are, with a picture of a wee baby hedgehog, because you deserve a nice photo after all that theory. These principles, you will notice that I refer back to these several times during this webinar. And I think if there's one thing you take away from this, from this talk, it's know these principles inside out, they are your friends. And the seven principles, gentle tissue handling, meticulous hemostasis, preservation of blood supply, strict aseptic technique, minimum tension, tension on tissues, accurate apposition of tissues, and obliteration of dead space. They're all common sense principles, which we probably do by second nature, but I think it's a good thing just to constantly have them at the forefront of our mind. Okay, here we are. Look at this, brilliant, a wound. We can get in there with our scalpel and our forceps. We can repair it and we can clean it up and we can make it look nice and neat. Don't, don't zoom in on the wound like this and ignore the rest of the animal in front of you. The first part of any wound assessment for me is to temporarily ignore the wound and look at the rest of a patient before diving in with our instruments. This wound hasn't killed the dog. Why? Because it sat there on the table looking at you. It won't do any harm to leave it a wee bit longer. Just because the wound might be the most obvious injury to the animal doesn't mean to say it's the most life-threatening. Have your own system, but it's vital to perform as full a clinical exam as is possible in the circumstances. And that's something I'm not going to cover today. Suffice to say, pay particular attention obviously to the cardiovascular, respiratory, 
and central nervous systems, along with checking for spinal, pelvic and other major orthopaedic injuries. We know about checking the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, but think about checking the ABCDs, airway, breathing, circulation and disability. Take your time here, please. Whatever you uncover may have significant consequences for your next steps. Remember the slide from earlier showing the types of serious injury that may accompany a dog or in this case here a cat with a nasty skin wound. This is our cat with a diaphragmatic hernia and this is the dog we saw earlier with the open fractures of both the radius and the ulna. You may need to intervene during your initial clinical exam with supplemental oxygen, analgesia, placing of IV catheters and IV fluids and the use of emergency diagnostics if they're available, such as x-ray and ultrasound. Only once we are satisfied that the patient is not critical and that we've administered any emergency treatments will we turn our attention to the wound itself. The only situation where I would prioritise the wound over a thorough clinical exam would be in cases where there was ongoing arterial bleeding which needed to be stemmed first. This is an example of a case where ongoing haemorrhage had to be stopped prior to further assessment of the patient. In this case, a Springer Spaniel with a deep circumferential laceration to the tissues of the right forelimb. You can see in this top left slide that the cephalic arteries and veins needed to be clamped in order to prevent significant blood loss. And we had to do this with immediate effect. You couldn't leave this animal um, for 10 minutes bleeding out of its cephalic vessels while you assessed it. The image on the left here shows a dog, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, with a, a deep cut to the foot um, that had to be stopped. The bleeding had to be stopped or, or slowed down as a matter of priority uh, to prevent unnecessary blood losses. The image on the right uh, speaks for itself. Uh, this was a, a cardiovascularly unstable animal, unstable dog. However, it required immediate anaesthesia in order to carry out initial management of this horrific abdominal wound. And quite clearly, you can see, you know, a lot of intestine has already been exteriorised. So you can see that initial patient triage will vary from patient to another, one patient to another, sorry. Um, but always address any underlying emergencies as a matter of priority before turning your attention to the wound itself. Okay, so let's, let's focus now on the wound uh, and the triage of the wound itself, now that we've done our initial assessment of the patient and dealt with any emergency situations. Wound triage, triage of the wound, basically means prioritising the different aspects of treating the wound in question. This is essential prior to any attempt to close the wound, either immediately or a matter of days later. Depending on patient temperament and other underlying health problems, it might be necessary to sedate or even give a light general anaesthetic in order to assess the wounds properly. The drugs used will very much depend on where you are, uh, where you're working and what's available. Obviously, some drugs have got advantages over others in various circumstances, but ultimately we've got to use what we have to the best of our abilities. We don't all have a massive pharmacy to reach into. For example, I would avoid ACP and alpha-2 agonists such as dexmedetomidine and xylazine in animals with cardiovascular or circulatory compromise, and instead I'd opt for more cardio-stable combinations such as a benzodiazepine like diazepam or midazolam combined with an opiate like methadone or buprenorphine. In cats, a reasonably safe combination to use in a trauma case would be perhaps ketamine combined with midazolam. Having said that, I've worked in situations where the only sedative available was xylazine um, and we were having to use this on malnourished, dehydrated dogs. So you, you've got to use what you've got available. That's the message. Analgesia is critical and it may be all that's required to allow proper assessment of the wound. Intravenous catheters should be placed as early as possible and used for drug delivery wherever possible. Giving a subcutaneous injection to a dehydrated or hypovolemic patient will result in very poor uptake of that drug due to the subcutaneous tissues being poorly perfused. <laughs> 
Local or regional anaesthesia can be used instead of or alongside systemic drugs. Many local protocols, such as infiltrative and splash blocks using lidocaine or bupivacaine, are very easy to perform in the field, as are some of the simpler nerve blocks. Remember always that animal in pain is also more likely to interfere with dressings or bite at the wound, so good analgesia will play an important role until the wound is completely healed. Administering an IV injection, intravenous injection of a broad spectrum antibiotic at the beginning of treatment and continued use for the appropriate time scale is also critical. I will often use either intravenous amoxicillin clavulanate or cephalosporin for this purpose. Whilst administering any intravenous medication, I would also attach some fluids. Hartman's or isotonic saline are ideal and use a fluid rate appropriate to the dehydration or shock state of the animal. Many of the street dogs that you're going to encounter will already be dehydrated, so correcting this is crucial. This isn't a place to get into fluid therapy, other than to say there are some great apps out there that do all the calculations for you. So you get one of those downloaded and make life easier for yourself and your patient. This one here from Mill Pledge, the Animal IV app, is excellent. Um, it's free, it's easy to use, and it's got lots of additional information to help you with any fluid therapy queries you might have whilst on the move on a busy day. Make it practice to insert an IV catheter into every trauma patient that you see as a matter of priority and make sure that that is firmly secured in place. Uh, there's nothing worse than accessing the collapsed vein of a hypovolemic animal for treatment to find the catheter slips out because it hasn't been secured properly. And this wee dog here, this wee Staffordshire Bull Terrier, can immediately be put on fluids whilst we assess our next step. Having the app to help you is great, but I think that there are some fluid therapy rates for crystalloids that you should always have memorised for immediate use. And these are just some of the main ones uh, for dogs. This is maintenance rate is 50 mils per kilogram per day, or two mils per kilogram per hour. Surgical rate, five milligrams per kilogram per hour for a healthy dog. And dehydration says on the slides, dogs that are five to 15% dehydrated will require 50 to 150 mils per kilogram body weight to replace their deficit. Plus obviously their ongoing maintenance requirements. This can be replaced over, for example, a 24 hour spell. Uh, animals that are less than 5% dehydrated I wouldn't be worried too much about intravenous fluid therapy for that reason. Dogs over 15% dehydrated are not going to live. Fluid therapy rates for shock in dogs. The estimated blood volume of dogs is 60 to 90 mils per kilogram. Cats, it's less. It's no more than 60 mils per kilogram. But this volume of fluid is not required because the, the patient will not have lost all of its blood volume. So the current thinking on shock therapy for dogs is to start by administering about a quarter of this blood volume, 10 to 20 mils per kilogram of isotonic crystalloids, that is Hartman's or saline, over 15 to 30 minutes, and then stop, reassess the patient's intravascular volume status, heart rate, capillary refill, pulse quality, mucous membrane color, consciousness, and then you can repeat subsequent boluses in the same manner as you need to. Cats are not as tolerant of fluid boluses as dogs are, so you need to be careful and use lower volumes, 10 to 15 mils per kilogram, for example. There are other fluids that can be considered in the treatment of hypovolemic shock, including hypertonic 7.5% saline and colloids, but this is really beyond the scope of today's talk. Wearing clean latex or nitrile gloves, apply a water-soluble sterile gel such as KY jelly to the wound surface before using clean clipper blades to clip extensively around the wound area. Never handle tissues with bare hands due to the risk of introducing additional bacteria to an already compromised wound. Remove any obvious foreign material like plant matter, grits, old sutures and cut back any obvious dead tissue with sterile scissors.
Try to do all of this in as clean an environment as you can, although I'm well aware that you may be approaching these cases in an outdoor environment. As well as using sterile KY jelly, you could also pack the wound with sterile swabs once clipping to protect against further contamination. Again, if the patient is anaesthetised, you could use sterile towel clamps to close the wound while clipping the surrounding area. Wound lavage is vital. Use an isotonic solution such as Hartman's or 0.9% saline to copiously lavage the wound. Isotonic solutions are non-toxic to cells, which is why they are preferred. If you don't have access to bags of Hartman's or saline, then use large amounts of bottled drinking water to lavage the wound. I've also seen myself putting a severely contaminated leg under a running tap in order to try and remove debris. This did require the dog to be heavily sedated. Again, it's a case of using what you've got available to you in the working environment that you find yourself in. There's been several studies on the ideal pressure to lavage tissue and current understanding is that this can be provided by using an 18 gauge needle with a 20 mil syringe, something that we've all got. In the photographs here, sterility can be improved by attaching the syringe to the end of the drip using a three way tap here, here and here. This means you don't have to keep inserting the needle into the fluid bag to draw more up. You could also just attach an 18 gauge needle directly to the end of the drip line and squeeze the bag. The aim is to keep a steady flow across the wound delivered at an oblique angle. Work from the top of the wound down so that any contaminated fluid doesn't flow over the area that you've just cleaned. As we've already discussed, many of us are not working in hospital environments. So we need to be able to understand what the ideal approach is and then get as close to it as we can. After this initial wound triage procedure, assuming the patient isn't going to be prepared for immediate surgery, then we've got to cover the wound with a sterile dressing to protect it against further contamination, trauma and infection. We also want to create the correct type of environment where the wound can start to heal. And if we remember back to when we were talking about partial oxygen pressure at the wound surface, this is where dressings come into their own. There are many options, techniques and opinions on dressing, so I'm only going to cover the practices that I think will be readily available and of use in the environments you'll be working in. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that we as vets can be very guilty of overcomplicating the process of dressing wounds and perhaps indulging in more dressing changes than are actually needed, particularly once the wound has moved healthily into the proliferative phase. Dressing wounds can be expensive in terms of both time, materials and also having to keep the animals in clinic. Unlike most pet dogs in the UK, for example, you might be presented with emaciated street dogs with chronic sores over bony prominences. These might take several weeks to get to the stage where surgical closure is feasible. And for this reason, we we'll need to select sensible but effective methods of dressing these wounds. Dressings are classically made up of the three layers. The primary, la primary layer, which is vital, it's in contact with the wound. There are many options available and this is where all of the research and money has gone. Secondary layer, padding, purpose of which is to maintain contact between the primary layer and the wound to eliminate dead space and absorb exudate. And you can use cast padding or cotton wool. And thirdly is your tertiary layer, waterproof and breathable. Use what's available, such as bandaging, or even incontinence pads can be used for this. Use what you have available. The primary or contact layer is where most of the excitement exists around what is best or most effective and yet there is little evidence-based clinical trial work to prove one way or the other. It's where the money is for the manufacturers. By using a primary layer, our aim is to create the optimum environment for moist wound healing to occur, something that we know is beneficial in the early stages. The most important thing I think to consider is how long do we need to apply these primary dressings to the wound for? In a single sentence, answer to this question could be 
until we have the presence of granulation tissue, that is, until about day four or five. When we have healthy granulation tissue, we really just need to concentrate on keeping the wound protected and it should progress to heal. The need for the moist wound healing environment becomes negligible after this. In our situation, however, when dealing with populations of street dogs, it is likely due to the severity and chronic nature of the wounds that we see that the primary dressings will be needed for significantly longer. But let's not fall into the trap of daily dressing changes when perhaps every third day will suffice. Every wound will dictate a different approach, but it helps to know the sequence of healing events that will be happening and how to respond to them. The two types of primary layer I use most often in the early stages when we are trying to create an environment for moist wound healing to occur. And these are sterile wet to dry swabs or polyurethane dressings with a hydrophilic core, such as a leave-in. So we're going to look at these two particularly primary layer dressings in a little more detail. There are, as I said, many more types in the market, but these two are both readily available to us all and I think can deal with most situations that we will be presented with. Sterile wet to dry swabs as your primary contact layer. These act as an adherent contact layer which actually mechanically debride the wound as they are removed. They consist of sterile open weave gauze swabs moistened with sterile isotonic saline and applied to the wound. You would then apply additional sterile dry swabs on top of these and then your secondary and tertiary bandage layers as normal. The swabs must be sterile. They could be moistened either with Hartman's or 0.9% saline because they're both isotonic and therefore won't cause cell damage at the wound level. Don't soak the swabs. Immerse or wet them thoroughly with saline or Hartman's and then squeeze the excess fluid out. If you soak the swabs, you risk a very wet dressing with a risk of bacterial strike through occurring. Make sure the swabs make good contact with all of the wound surface when you're applying them. Use woven swabs wherever possible since they adhere to the wound more effectively. In the picture here you've got non-woven swabs on the left and woven type swabs on the right and you can see from their structure why they will adhere more to the wound. How do wet to dry sterile swabs actually work? This slide just describes it rather simply. The contact layer is initially isotonic because it's soaked in saline or Hartman's. It becomes hypertonic as the water evaporates from the dressing. Fluid is drawn from the wound into these hypertonic swabs. And this fluid contains cells, protein, and it forms an impermeable debris layer. At this point, the swab dries out and it's got to be changed. This type of dressing should never be left in place for more than 24 hours and they can be painful to remove so they might require sedation. Dirt and foreign material adhere to the dressing and so they get removed along with the dressing. It's perfect for wounds that contain a lot of necrotic debris or exudate and you often find that you only need to apply wet to dry dressings a couple of times before being able to switch to a primary layer type that can be left in place for longer spells. You do not ever want to apply wet to dry swabs to a wound that is starting to granulate and epithelialize. Why? You will simply keep removing this newly formed healthy tissue. The second type of primary contact layer we will talk about are the hydrophilic polyurethane foams. These act as non-adherent contact layers which don't mechanically debride the wound on removal. Remember that our wet to dry swabs mechanically debride their adherent. These dressings consist of a highly absorbent hydrophilic foam with a semi-permeable backing. You cover the dressing with the secondary and tertiary, tertiary bandage layers as normal. This type of dressing does not adhere to the wound, so there's no mechanical debridement function. They do, however, allow autolytic debridement to occur, whereby the body's own enzymes and cells dissolve and remove debris from the wound by creating exudate. For this reason, 
I tend to use this in wounds with less necrotic debris or contamination. As with wet to dry swabs, it will provide the moist healing environment we're looking for in the early stages and the semi-permeable membrane allows gaseous exchange without losing the moisture. The hydrophilic core draws fluid away from the wound. These dressings are useful in both the inflammatory and the proliferative stages of wound healing on account of them being non-adherent. Unlike the wet to dry swabs which can't be used beyond the initial inflammatory phase, otherwise they will debride granulation tissue and epithelial tissue as it develops. This type of primary dressing I will also use once wounds are granulating as well, and it can be left in place for much longer periods of time, for up to five to seven days in some cases. Foam dressings are more comfortable for the patient and they also help keep the skin immediately adjacent to the wound dry. We don't get maceration of the skin round about the wound. It could be said that these types of foam dressings are like Hartman's solution. There are very few contraindications. They are, however, not cheap. It's worth making a mention at this stage of the use of tie over dressings. Tie over dressings can be used to hold either wet to dry or hydrophilic polyurethane foam dressings in place in difficult to bandage areas such as the flanks or the hips. Under sedation during triage, or simply by infiltrating tissues with local anaesthetic solution, pre-place some proline or other non-absorbable, cruciate interrupted cutaneous sutures around the wound and use these as anchors to tie in the secondary and tertiary layers over your contact layer. You can also use tubular stretch bandage to secure dressings over difficult to bandage areas. I'm not going to go into any other initial wound care methods or materials since it's beyond the scope of one lecture, one seminar. Use what you've got available, whether it's what I use myself or whether it's honey, maggots, vacuum units, silver dressings, other dressing types, there is a huge list. Just bear in mind how a wound behaves and how you can best protect it while it heals in the particular work environment you find yourself in. The image on the right here is a dressing, a tie over dressing applied to an extreme high tail amputation that suffered repeat breakdown. Here the surgeon has used drip tubing looped around pre-placed proline sutures to tie the dressing in place. And you can also see here a homemade closed active suction drain using a syringe to provide the vacuum. Another possibility, you could use disposable nappies as a potential solution for highly exudative wounds. Use your imagination. We're going to have to talk a little bit about bandaging problems. Um, and I've put some images up here. Slide one um, shows the chronic pressure sore over the os calcis of a dog down to the level of exposing the tendon. Slide two, severe deep tissue necrosis resulting from an emmer sling, which is a form of bandage used to keep a dislocated hip in place. I personally never apply these unless that animal is going to be hospitalized under constant supervision. I've seen too many go disastrously wrong. And slide three is your typical bandage sores over the bony prominences of the foot. And you can see the excess granulation tissue forming here. So we need to talk briefly about bandaging and the potential problems and pitfalls associated with it. Uh, I've seen animals require whole limbs or tails amputated because of poorly applied or maintained bandages. And I'm sad to say I've also seen an animal required to be euthanized following severe ascending necrosis of tissue after a bandage that was applied too tightly and for too long. Often these bandages were applied for relatively minor reasons in the first place. And that's the frustrating thing. I I'm so concerned by the potential damage that bandages can cause that almost always during orthopaedic surgery, I will immobilize a limb postoperatively using an external skeletal fixator frame for four weeks rather than using bandages. A bandage can be incorrectly applied in the first place, or it can be correctly applied and then later pulled or tightened by the pet, resulting in severe complications. In the situations that you as vets are working, you will often find that street dogs will come to you already having had rudimentary bandages applied by the well-meaning public, and often these can be causing more harm than the original injury. Trauma caused by poor bandaging either before or after vet treatment 
can have a major impact on the animal's welfare and even life. Obvious complications with bandages include faecal and urine soiling, the bandage getting wet outside and bandages slipping. More serious complications include dermatitis, pressure sores as we can see in these images and swollen digits where the foot is exposed. Applying bandages too tightly can also inhibit epithelialization of a wound, um, a wound that's healing by second intention. This, this wee cat here um, required stifle immobilization for three to four weeks following a major trauma and a laterally placed external skeletal fixator in my hands anyway provides significantly less complications in bandaging. Um, both dogs and cats tolerate external skeletal fixators very well and in my opinion a lot better than they would a whole limb bandage. A slide full of text, unfortunately again. As with everything, there is a classification system for wounds based upon their basic levels of cleanliness. This is a very basic representation of that classification with the emphasis on traumatic wounds. So you've initially got what we consider clean wounds, bitch spay incisions, primary closure, no drains. Not many of the dogs you see are going to have clean wounds. A clean contaminated wound, is a clean surgical procedure that requires drains. Contaminated wounds, traumatic wounds less than four to six hours, and infected or dirty wounds, traumatic wounds over four to six hours. For our purposes in this talk, all of the wounds that will come in will be at the very least contaminated and most likely infected or dirty. Our aim is to convert these using lavage, antibiotics, debridement and dressings to clean contaminated wounds that can then be closed over a drain. Once the wound has got to a healthy stage and one where you feel it has a good chance of responding well to surgical closure, it's time to operate. For me, the most frustrating and challenging part has already been done in getting the wound to the point of surgery. Some wounds you're presented with may be very fresh and amenable to immediate surgery. Some will be chronic and require a lot of dressing work beforehand. And some again may be chronic but severe, needing initial debridement and exploration of deeper tissues with closure of the skin at a later date. The surgical closure of wounds can be broken into five principal classes, as in the slides that I'm showing just now. Uh, initially, We've got primary closure, um, which means the immediate closure of skin to skin within a very short time of the wound. And if you think back to that border collie that we showed at the beginning with the slice on its nose, that would be a good case for primary closure. Delayed primary closure. Uh, closure is delayed a couple of days, but before the presence of granulation tissue. And that's probably because we're unsure about tissue viability. We're not 100% sure that this is going to heal straight away. Secondary closure. If the above two, primary and delayed primary, are not possible due to persistent infection or the need for debridement, then we go for secondary closure. Uh, secondary closure occurs after day five, that is, once there is the presence of granulation tissue. Tertiary closure, similar to secondary closure, but necessitates the excision of granulation tissue prior to the wound being closed. And finally, we've got second intention healing. Uh, second intention healing, there is no surgical closure, but you're relying upon wound contraction and epithelialization for that wound to heal. Um, the types of wounds that you're going to be seeing in these street dogs, you can almost certainly rule out primary closure. So you will be looking at these four categories. So lots of wee baby hedgehogs here, since they've asked you to read some more boring text. Sorry about that. This is an example of primary closure of a wound uh, and here we've used interdermal and subcutaneous sutures uh, and you can do that if there's no excess tension on the wound. Suturing here is continuous, the knots are buried beneath the skin. Um, interdermal knots gives an excellent cosmetic result, uh, there's reduced bacterial wicking 
they're less prone to patient interference and there's no need for suture removal. So if you are lucky enough to be able to do a primary closure in a street dog, for example, you don't need to get that dog back to take the stitches out. Um, you can add cutaneous, simple or cruciate interrupted suture if there's any skin tension present. This is an example of a, a delayed primary closure where surgery was delayed for several days. Um, you close before the presence of granulation tissue here, i.e. before day five, and you can see that this wound has been closed over a Penrose drain. This is an example of a secondary closure in a dog. Um, and remember, secondary closure means closure is delayed, surgery is delayed for five days until we've got the presence of a granulation tissue bed. Um, and this tends to be done when you've got persistent infection, prolonged inflammation, or you've needed serial debridement. Uh, and if we go start from here, here's our original wound. Um, this necrotic looking tissue has been debrided. And here, later on, we have the presence of a granulation bed. So this is the wound at least five days on from original presentation. Um, secondary closure, closure over that granulation bed. Um, there is placement of cutaneous sutures here. We're not just relying on our intradermals. We're using cutaneous sutures as well. This is in a limb. It's over an area of movement, so there is going to be tension. Uh, and this is just prior to suture removal. This is an example of tertiary closure, which again is after the formulation of granulation tissue. But the difference between a secondary and tertiary closure is tertiary closure requires the uh, excision of the excess granulation tissue. So you can see this um, chronic granulation bed. It's sitting up proud of the skin edges. So that has all been resected back. Uh, skin edges freshened up and that has allowed us to perform a closure. And again, this cutaneous sutures are necessary here. This is over the oscalsis, so it's a point of tension and movement. And the final group is the second intention healing group, um, where the wound heals by granulation, contraction and epithelialization. This tends to get utilised in very dirty or infected wounds or wounds where there's limited skin available, i.e. the tail and extremities. It's a last resort form of healing, really. Um, it can be utilised in the trunk wounds of young puppies and kittens um, because they have a phenomenal um, second intention healing capability. This particular wound that you're looking at here, it has to be said that this would not go on to heal because it's, it's over the foot, the distal extremity. This would require uh, grafting or some other form of um, assistance to heal. This slide is just a good example of second intention healing of rather a large wound. You've got granulation here, a nice healthy red granulation bed, uh, and you can see the epithelialization, the pale pink area around the edges here. And if we go on to this slide here, you can see that this wound is contracting down very nicely. And that went on to heal without any surgical intervention at all.